do it, but shit. Oh my god. How are we doing so far with weather? Okay. Is anybody any? Yeah. A anybody? Anybody picked up just a couple things? A couple of. Okay. All right. It definitely can. Um, you know, it, it's kind of. It's a little bit like riding a bicycle. A little bit. And that, you know, once you know it, you know how to do it, and that's fine. You've done it once, and then you set the bicycle down, and you don't do it again for four, five, six, seven, eight months. You might have to relearn how to do that. What I find is that when pilots first start with this weather challenge, and that is making the go, no go decision, that decision that you have to make before you make your solo flights, you know, instructor isn't going to let you go if it's a no go, but you need to say either yes or no, you will or won't. Or what the conditions are, conditions might change as you go and how you're going to accomplish that. So you're very, very close to getting there. But what I find is pilots along the way, before they get there, uh, sometimes they, they, don't, they don't practice the due diligence that you really owe yourself, your passengers, the people that you're flying over and all this other, uh, all of the other parties that are involved. Uh, you don't do that enough because you get to the airport, the flight instructor grabs you up real quick, talks about a few things, and then you go to the airplane and you just fly. And the weather is usually pretty good. You're not going to get any kind of uh, any kind of dangerous weather. And if it was dangerous, you would know on your ride to the school that it was probably going to be dangerous. And you would certainly know when you went out there to pre-flight the airplane, hey, this is probably not looking great. But what I recommend is do that weather brief, do that, you know, log in and register. How many people now, right now, this is day three, how many of you have registered already for 1-800-WX-BRIEF.COM? Okay, that one, anybody else? I, I know, and, and, and you won't do it. And I know that because most pilots just don't. Uh, the problem is, is unless you start practicing it now, and unless you start practicing it on your own, you won't know how to do it when you're trying to plan that first flight. Nobody's around me. I don't have an instructor. I have a certificate. I want to make this flight now happen. You won't know how to do it on your own. So I'm trying to help you get the tools and start gathering the experience and developing those skills now so that you are confident in your own skills along the training process. That's what you should do. And if you're not, then you can address it along the way. It, it, those weather briefs and those pre-flight briefs sometimes get pushed to the side just a little bit because we want to get out there and fly. There is a little bit of reality for that. Okay, schedules are tight, airplanes are constantly flying, check rides will happen, and if that's your favorite airplane, then you're not using it because whoever is on their check ride, they will have the access to that airplane because when you have your check ride, guess who has access to that airplane? You do, right? But aside from these things being almost a nuisance, do your, do your own homework before coming to the airport, at least log in and start looking at some of those reports. Because if you don't practice that, it'll just be like you learned how to ride a bike one day and then you didn't ride it again. And all of a sudden now you need to ride a bike and it's very difficult. It's a little bit more of a challenge. You're not as good as you are if you would have practiced every day. So just kind of uh, pro tips, would you say, right? Words to the, rock, to the wise. All right. Let's get started. Weather hazards. There's my key terms, not as bad. Air mass thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms, single cell, supercell, bunch of thunderstorms, right? Cumulus stage, mature stage, again, dissipating stage, gust front, roll front, thunderstorms. Half that list is all thunderstorms. Shear zone, tornado, 
associated with thunderstorms. Water spout. What's the difference between a tornado and a water spout? I'll tell you. A tornado is just a whirling around. We know what a tornado is, right? Well, it, it's, it's that, but over land. A water spout is the exact same thing over water. All right, so we see them quite often out there in the ocean or over the Everglades in the watery part of the Everglades. It's just a water spout. It's a tornado, but it's over water, not land. Low level turbulence. We're going to start talking about some other uh, hazards and dangers uh, besides just the thunderstorm. Mechanical turbulence, convective turbulence. Yeah, all right, a bunch of turbulence, a bunch of turbulence up here. Capping stable layer. Where's that at? That's where pilots want to be. Climb above all that convection, get above that capping stable layer, and you get a nice smooth ride up there. Wake turbulence, jet engine blast, clear air turbulence. Like I said, a whole bunch of turbulence, man-made and all sorts of different turbulence. Jet stream, we're gonna talk about it only so much as where does it exist? In the tropopause, that's about it. And it moves from west to east. And in the winter time, it's more powerful, it's stronger, and it moves further down the United States, right? So instead of in the summertime, it's, it's weaker and stays up in Canada and all the uh, Great Lakes area. In the winter time, it's stronger and it comes down further, makes us cold down there in Florida, okay? Uh, so jet stream, mountain waves, rotor, wind shaft, microburst, all turbulence. Low-level wind shear alert systems, low, our terminal Doppler weather radar. How can I identify the, or, or what devices are available to identify these weather hazards and they can communicate that to other flight crews before it becomes a problem, all right? Rime ice, clear ice, mix ice, bunch of ice. Haze, smoke, smog, dust, and volcanic ash. I think you guys are gonna like this one. All right, here we go. All right. All right. So anyways, take a look at this squall line. A squall line is exactly like this. Where is this picture from? Courtesy of NASA. All right. So it's from, it's from space somewhere. I don't know where, which one, whatever. But it's a squall line is clearly visible in this photograph from space. That's a long line of thunderstorms. Sometimes we have this phenomena over Florida and Florida is just a little bitty peninsula and it will cover the entire thing. So if we're trying to fly airplanes from the south to the north, we may not be able to do that. Well, you could argue, what does Delta do? What does US Air, well, US Airways doesn't exist anymore. What does American do? What does Spirit do? <laughs> I got a great answer for you. They buy a Boeing. That's exactly what they have. They got Boeings, okay? We don't have Boeings. You're not gonna train in a 777, all right? That would be a remarkable thing, but how much would that cost? So, no, the, the capabilities of our aircraft don't allow us to climb over this or to find our way through that storm. If we were so equipped and so uh, prepared to, or, or, or so rated to fly instruments. We're not rated to fly instruments, we're not equipped with the airplane to fly instruments. We're not equipped on onboard radar, and this would definitely break the airplane apart, okay? So thunderstorms, these things are very, very hazardous. You see my guy getting socked one right in the head, right? This, remember my advisory circular that I was telling you about? Advisory circular 00-6 Bravo, and that was updated in 2018. This was an actual photo an illustration in Advisory Circular 006 Alpha, the one that came out in 74. I just love that picture and I had it in my slides forever and ever, okay? But this is the kind of stuff you're gonna find in that squall line. Now, what did I need in order for this guy to form in the first place? Well, I need three ingredients. There they are. Lifting source, unstable conditions, high humidity. If you have those three things, then you have what it takes to make angry here, okay? If it doesn't mean necessarily that the thunderstorm will be there, but it means the conditions exist. 
That also means that I will have what's called a convective outlook, right? There may be convective activity. There's not necessarily a sigmet there. There's not a convective sigmet there yet, but the, the source regions and all of the surrounding area include a lifting source, unstable conditions, and high humidity. Nearly every single, and when I say nearly, I mean from mid-March until sometime in October, the entire state of Florida will have all three of those. So we will be constantly under thunderstorm conditions. Doesn't mean that they're there. It means that the ingredients are available. Now, identifying the thunderstorms. These are the three stages. It's important for me to know the three stages. Cumulus stage, because it's a cumulus cloud. Mature stage, this is the most hazardous stage when it's the most violent right here. And the dissipating stage. The cumulus stage is mostly updrafts, okay? It's characterized as mostly updrafts. What's the ride here? If I fly my little 172 into that cloud, what kind of ride am I gonna get? Very bumpy. And by very bumpy, I mean, you're gonna want to reconsider ever flying again. It will not be pleasant, okay? Look at this cloud, it goes up to 20,000 feet. You can normally see these clouds and watch them growing. If you're anywhere near them, you can watch them rising like this and just developing. It looks like a witch's spell. I mean, it looks absolutely horrifying. Going inside that cloud is gonna make you wanna change your mind about getting back in an airplane. Okay. Okay. Mature stage. Now I have rain falling to the surface, meaning it's no longer only characterized by updrafts. I also have downdrafts. The downdrafts create something right here that I experienced the other day, which was, it's interesting is you never get this in Florida, but I touched somebody's hand and I felt the spark. I was like, oh man, that's weird. Right. And, and, and and I used to feel that all the time in Michigan. We don't get it in Florida, but that's just static electricity. But exactly, well that too, but just because these two areas, the updrafts and the downdrafts are going together, this is like somebody rubbing their feet on the carpet, but doing it at about 1400 miles an hour, right? Because you've got a lot of updrafts and a lot of, look how far they're going. They're going from 5,000 feet up to 40,000 feet and then coming back down. So that is a long, long way. That's several miles worth of things moving back and forth against each other and creating friction and creating static electricity. Well, creating static electricity, what's gonna happen then? Every single time, lightning. If you don't have lightning, you don't have a thunderstorm. It might look like it's pretty bad. It might be raining, that's okay but there's not a thunderstorm until there's lightning. Most lightning storms, moderate lightning storms, are gonna have two to three lightning strikes per second. So I don't mean lightning like, oh look, it finally had a lightning bolt. Now we got a thunderstorm. No, these things are rapidly uh, spitting out lightning, okay? The more lightning I have, the more hazardous and the more intense that storm is. Naturally, it kind of makes sense just a little bit. Well, of course, the offspring of lightning is thunder. Okay, fine, thunderstorm. So, okay, everything's starting to fall together here. If I told you that that was gonna make you seriously second guess ever flying again, this, is, this could potentially break the airplane, this airplane, okay? No matter what you do with it, I understand you wanna slow down, you wanna get less than, uh, uh, maneuvering speed. You're not trying to maintain anything constant. You're not trying to maintain a constant altitude, a constant airspeed, a constant attitude, a constant heading. You're, all you're trying to do is keep the side that's greasy down. That's all you're trying to do. Keep it right side up. But 
this could very likely break that airplane, and it has broken airplanes before, okay? I need to stay at least 20 nautical miles away from any thunderstorm, because there are other hazards that might come out of this thing as well. But 20 nautical miles, well, how far is that? Remember yesterday we looked at the Class Bravo area in Miami? Remember there's an area where I had to have a mode C transponder, now mode S? How far away is that from Miami? 30, right? So that ring was 30 nautical miles from the center of Miami out to the side. You need to stay nearly that far away from a thunderstorm, okay? That's a long ways. If you show up in the summertime, I cannot promise you that you won't be any closer than 20 nautical miles to a thunder. Nobody has a yardstick out there. We don't have a, we don't carry a 20 nautical mile pole out there with us and say, yeah, we're exactly 20 miles away, right? No, you might be on occasion a little bit closer or slightly closer. I wouldn't cancel my flight. In other words, if there was a thunderstorm over Miami International, but I need to consider the other hazards. All right. So we'll talk about these other hazards. The rule is though, 20 nautical miles. I, I say that so many times because I, I, have, I have had a few students not pass on their first attempt, okay? In the past, however many years, I think it's been 16, 17, I can't even remember how many years that I've been flying, I've been teaching, but I've endorsed hundreds and hundreds of pilots and occasionally one will not pass. And one didn't pass, because the examiner asked him in the oral exam, uh, how far do we need to stay away from a thunderstorm? And he said, I'm thinking maybe two, maybe three miles. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, somehow or another, that didn't get translated over properly. Actually, this was a, was a US guy, he was from New York, born in New York, lived in New York. How did you not know what I said when I said 20? He thought two. Huh? Anyways, all right, dissipating stage, primarily downdrafts, and this is just uh, the end of the thunderstorm. If it's just a normal single cell, single, just normal life thunderstorm. Well, earlier we talked there could be a supercell. You remember the key terms? There was one on there, supercell. What that means is the, the unstable conditions and the humidity continue to feed that storm. So this thing becomes almost like a perpetual motion device, except that it's perpetually generating itself. It makes a thunderstorm and as it dissipates, the dissipation form right back into the storm. And these storms could last for several hours, okay? So uh, even in our area, not very common. If, if they're, was one or if there are few of those in the area, everybody would know about it, including you. It would be a little bit uncomfortable all around. It, it, you would notice that storm, okay? Okay, <clears throat> take a look at this. I've got, looks like a cumulus stage cloud, okay? I got rain coming out. I think Jepson mentioned in this figure that they said, hey, I got rain coming out of this cloud, so it's the mature stage. I can tell you from experience that if this was a thunderstorm, which I don't see any lightning or anything near thunderstorm around it, it could possibly be a very, very small thunderstorm. But this thing is, I, I would fly over here in this blue sky area. Probably not two. <laughs> What's the right answer always? Thank you, 20. Yeah, I'd be probably two miles away over here. I would not, I would be pretty close to this thing. And I know I'll explain why here in just a little bit, but this is not the typical storm that you're going to see. Uh, a lot of time pilots that come over from Russia, pilots that come over from Moscow, they cannot believe the magnitude of these storms once they get over there. It's, it, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Before the thunderstorm gets to you, remember slide one, I showed you a picture from space, okay? That was the squall line. Prior to these storms getting there, you might have a gust front or a gust cloud 
or some, I think Joe calls them the, the plow front coming through. This is in front of a thunderstorm. And this contains, uh, number one, a warning that bad weather is behind it. And, and, and number two, uh, this gives me the assumption and probably the indication this storm is moving very, very fast. If I see something like this outside, it's time to just go to the cafe and order a burger and a Coca-Cola and wait for just a little bit later. It's probably moving very fast. And, th and that is, like I said, that's that gust front that's just coming through in front of the actual storm itself. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Jepson wanted me to say that this was a dissipating stage. I've tried my best from flight decks to take pictures of dissipating stage storms. You can see, especially from, from the top of them, it's really kind of neat. It almost looks like everyone's seen, uh, the, the black holes and stuff like that, where a star explodes and then it implodes back into itself. And you can see it just, I don't know what they call it, the uh, event horizon, I think they call that. Anyways, that's th almost what it looks like. It's really kind of interesting and it's beautiful to watch. You can see the storm just sucking itself down from all directions and characterized all by downdrafts. And then you got some mist and fog all across the top of it. That's your dissipating stage. Everything is dissipating out of this cloud. Probably not a great day to be on the surface, but usually even in these, you know, crappy little airplanes, I can fly over this. I can fly over this and get to where I'm going. Where I'll find this normally is on those instrument flights and I'm above the cloud deck and I can see where storms are left, right, all behind me and over me. And you can see the ones that are starting to fall down and that's your dissipating stage. Okay. Earlier, not too very early ago, just a little bit ago, we were talking 20 nautical miles. There's a reason for 20 nautical miles. Now I told you, I said, Jepson put this thing on there. They wanted me to call this a, a thunderstorm. <laughs> I just laugh if I think that's a thunderstorm. Is it a thunderstorm by definition? Okay, yeah, probably. But again, this is probably where my, my guy got confused two, three miles. This is the reason why I want to make sure I stay 20 nautical miles away from a thunderstorm because there are other hazards around that thunderstorm. This particular thunderstorm, you can see which way the winds are going, the prevailing winds in this area are moving this way. So I've got updrafts, I've got some downdrafts, that's fine. But these storms can go all the way up into the stratosphere. Once they reach that tropopause, that jet stream and those upper level winds are going to move the storm as it continues to grow in the direction of the upper air winds. They call it an anvil. You guys familiar with an anvil? Okay. This is good because I've only found one word, I think, where everybody didn't know it. Have you watched the road runner? Oh no. Wiley coyote. Uh, Wiley coyote. Oh no. I need to update my slides. Rem remember the road runner? They got beep beep and it, it was really, really fast cartoon, right? Okay. What did, what always fell on Wiley coyote? Remember he was chasing the road runner. He was setting a trap for him and it always backfired and the anvil fell on Wiley coyote and it crushed him every single time. Oh no. Okay. That's fine. So we're okay. I'm not going to use the Wiley coyote story anymore with my Russian crowds, but it, it's, it's something that, that, uh, tool makers and steel workers would use and they would hammer on it, a, a big piece of metal. And it had like a, an anvil side to it, a very long side on one side like this. That anvil is shaped a lot like this. We're going to have to Google search anvil, A-N-V-I-L. Okay. All right. This anvil, like I mentioned, you got updrafts that are coming along here. As it grows into those upper level winds, it's going to go all the way across and continue to grow and continue to generate hazardous weather. One of the hazards that comes out of these storms is hail. Okay. 
Hail is terribly, and we'll see on some of these next couple slides, the hail is terribly damaging to aircraft. All right. This is, the re this is exactly why you got 20 nautical miles away from a thunderstorm. All right. That small little thunderstorm that we're talking about over here. Oh, well, if you get a little closer, then don't, don't go telling the FAA on me. All right. Okay, lightning, again, like I mentioned earlier, lightning is one of the hazards that's always associated with thunderstorms. Is lightning going to hurt a flight crew? No. Why not? Yeah, exactly. I'm not grounded. There's no ground, so it, it just passed right through. Okay? So it might be a little a bit of a nuisance. It could damage some of my electrics but it is not a hazard to flight crews. This is, this pilot flew through hail. That's what hail is gonna to do to a Cessna 172. Now on one of my classes, I think it was three years ago, four years ago, on that exact same day that I was going through this hail class, I got a, a news alert. And, you know, such and such, this and that, uh, crash with or emergency landing at. You know, I look at these things. I like to find out about emergencies. I like to find out what went wrong. You know, how can we learn about that or whatever? Well, that's hail. Okay, and you can see the guy holding the hail. And that's what it did to an airline. Okay. The two pilots have absolutely got to be fired. I'm just telling you, you can't bring back an airplane looking like this and then get in another airplane and go fly again. Right? So not a great day. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> tornadoes. Ta-da. I know this is a tornado because I see ground, right? I see land. If it were over water, what would I call it? Water spout. That's correct, a water spout. Okay, let's talk turbulence for a moment. This is mechanical turbulence. Mechanical turbulence produced downwind of obstructions, line of trees, buildings, and hills. Anyone flying at South Florida, you will experience mechanical turbulence. I don't know where you wouldn't experience mechanical turbulence, but what I'm telling you is you get plenty of it. There are busy airports there and busy airports have usually a lot of people that want to buy airplanes and leave them at the airport. What do they put those airplanes in? Hangars. And then you got terminal buildings. You got all this other stuff. When the wind blows across that, it gets very turbulent as you try to land the airplane. Well, that just makes it challenging. It really does. Also, some of the non-congested areas, some of the rural areas, Pahokee, Airglades, places like that you'll have certain man-made features next to it. If you notice that big lake going all the way around there and right next to Pahokee, there's a berm that goes all the way next to that lake to prevent flooding. The wind as it comes over that berm has mechanical turbulence and it changes a little bit as you start getting ready to land, okay? So mechanical turbulence is just a normal part of life. This is something that you just, you either like it, love it, hate it, but no matter what, you don't get a choice, it's gonna be there, okay? Okay, winds across the mountain valleys. We hit on this just a little bit before, but winds moving across a gentle sloping valley produce winds that generally follow the valley contour. It's just gonna follow the valley contour, go up and go down. And that's in a gentle sloping valley. If it's really strong uh, or in a narrow canyon with a cliff, no really strong crosswinds, turbulence and downdrafts occur downwind on the side of the valley. So the wind goes down and it will follow the valley. What kind of training am I going to take if I need to do any type of mountain flying or valley flying? Specialized training in addition to, this is nice to know, we're probably not going to spend a lot of time, you may not be tested on it, okay? What you will know are your thermals. Sun heats the ground unevenly, depending on if it's grass, concrete, asphalt, whatever you got, buildings, water. So the sun is gonna heat the earth unevenly. 
I'll have thermals from that. Air will heat up, rise, and make some turbulent conditions. This is my capping stable layer. If I can climb above that capping stable layer, I find nice smooth air. Now, it comes with a grain of salt because I have to be a private pilot before I can fly over a layer of clouds. That's called VFR over the top. So if I have a broken layer or an overcast, I can't get through it because it's a, a completely closed uh, area. I don't have a way to get up. But if I have a broken layer of clouds and I'm a student pilot, I cannot find a hole like this pilot did and climb above and enjoy the smooth air. It's just not regulatorily sound. I can't do it. As a private pilot, you can, but as a student pilot, you cannot. If it's a scattered layer of clouds or, or it's just few clouds, that's fine. I can climb above that because it's not a ceiling. In another segment, we're gonna discuss, in fact, in the sources of weather information, we're gonna discuss exactly what constitutes a ceiling and how do they describe few, scattered, broken, overcast, and so forth, okay? But just know, we've talked about this for a little while, climbing above the clouds and having a nice, nice ride. I gotta wait until I'm a private pilot to do it. So don't tell your examiner on the oral exam as a student pilot that, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that for sure. You gotta wait until you're a private pilot before you climb over the clouds. Okay, some turbulence is created man-made. Uh, aside from the fact that we probably made the buildings and the berms and whatever is causing mechanical turbulence, some of it's man-made, meaning those wingtip vortices that we talked about yesterday, the ones that make my induced drag, those are very, very powerful. They're very, very strong on medium-sized jets and definitely large jets. So. Anytime that airplane is creating lift, anytime any airplane is creating lift, it creates wingtip vortices. Those larger airplanes, when they create lift, those wingtip vortices could be dangerous to me. So if I am landing my airplane behind a larger airplane, I wanna stay above their glide path and land beyond their touchdown point. Notice how they touch down here? That's where the wingtip vortices stop. Now, wind will move these, okay? So the wingtip vortices are created by the airplane, but if I have a crosswind or a tailwind, it, that wind will move those wingtip vortices because where do they exist? Are they touching the ground? No. They're in the atmosphere, and if the atmosphere is moving, then wherever that airplane was when it was created, it will move those wingtip vortices the same direction that the wind is moving. Okay, if I wanna take off, or correction, if I wanna land behind an airplane that just took off, I make sure I land and come to a stop before the liftoff point. That shouldn't be any problem at all. You need about 600 feet to land this thing. Any airplane where I'm gonna have a concern for their wingtip vortices, they'll need at least three, 4,000 feet before they rotate. So there's no worries at all in my training airplane to not be able to stop or get off the runway before they rotate it, okay? Now this is uh, one small exception. But this is where the airplane generates the most hazardous wake turbulence. And that is when it's heavy, just took off, full of fuel, slow, just took off, so they're still climbing, and clean, eh, this one's got the landing gear down. If they had their landing gear retracted and their flaps up, that's when they generate the most hazardous wake turbulence. Okay, when do they put up their landing gear? As soon as they take off, right? And they bring their flaps up on a schedule. 
So it's shortly after they take off, this is when that airplane creates the most dangerous wingtip vortices, all right? Okay, when departing after a long aircraft has landed, lift off beyond its touchdown location. This guy landed somewhere and I'm gonna continue forward and then take off afterwards. One of my favorite ones is the bottom one. Because it makes sense for me to rotate and climb before that airplane takes off, right? Everybody on board with that? Does everybody agree that makes sense? But there's something here that's kind of stupid. And that is this airplane is gonna climb three, 4,000 feet a minute. And that's if they're taking their time, okay? You have not a chance in the world, believe me when I tell you that, of climbing and staying above that flight path. But there's something you can do. You got to go upwind. So if I have a crosswind somewhere, if I have wind, let's say it's coming from this direction right here. Okay. Everybody's taken off into the wind because they have a headwind component and they have a crosswind component. Once I take off, I want to turn my airplane this way because whatever wingtip vortices are created here are moving that way. They're moving with the wind. Okay. All right. Something else that's hazardous behind jet airplanes, the thrust. A 747 can create 100 mile an hour winds behind it, going from the stopping point here to get out onto the runway. And 300 mile an hour winds behind it while it's at takeoff. Fort Lauderdale Executive has all sorts of business jets, light, medium, some heavy jets, Global Expresses, Gulfstream 750 or whatever the newest one is. They have plenty of that stuff. Some of these airplanes will create a lot of thrust, but you don't have to stay three miles away from it. Just don't get so close that you'd be potentially knocked over if they, if they power up, okay? Just a consideration. All right. Uh, after the wake, wake turbulence uh, or this? If uh, the deep plane to go, uh -huh. and uh, what time does it take uh, Ah, I think there's a rule of thumb for that. It, it all depends. And it all depends on uh, where the winds are coming from. Like if I got a crosswind or a headwind or a tailwind or what, because that's going to move it out of the way. So there are a lot of factors in it. But I think there's a rule of thumb published in one of our books five minutes, three to five minutes or five minutes or something like that. But I can also tell you, you know, from a, from a practical standpoint, if, if I have a jet take off in front of me and I'm in one of the school's training airplanes and I have a global express, one of the biggest things we'll have at that airport and it takes off right in front of me, or if it lands right in front of me and I'm getting ready to take off, You'll hear ATC and they'll tell you caution wake turbulence. That's a legal obligation for them to say, I told the pilot, if they crash, I'm not at fault. Okay. So they'll say caution wake turbulence clear for takeoff runway nine or I'll usually take off. Now, I'm not going to sit there and not take off because of it, but there are, you know, if you're flying at a much larger facility, not that the global doesn't make a lot of wake turbulence, it 100% it does, and it could do some damage to that airplane. But right there, I'm confident that I can take off and I can remain upwind. I'm definitely going to take off before they rotated. If they landed there, believe me when I tell you that the pilot that flies the global is going to touch down in the touchdown zone. So it's only a thousand feet. I know that I can take off after them. All right. So if they land in front of me or they take off in front of me, I'm, I'm still going to take off. Well, I'm on the ground. It's not dangerous uh, when I pass. 
Now, when you pass it, that's when it becomes dangerous, right? Yep. Same thing on landing. Now, sometimes, and, and there is this, this thing called a touch and go. It, it's where you don't completely finish the landing sequence and you never really completely do the takeoff sequence. But you put the airplane on the ground and you retract the flaps, you power up, and then you take off again. Depending on where you are in your program, depending on what you're working on, a touch and go could be a good thing. Learning how to land, learning how to take off, this is not a time to do touch and go. Because you need to land, continue to fly the airplane on the ground, right? Continue to fly the airplane, continue to finish that landing sequence, get it off the runway, finish your after landing checks, continue to fly the airplane, right? You guys were on the ground, you're saying, why are you flying the airplane? Remember those crosswind corrections that we had? Wherever, if I had headwind or tailwind from the quartering side, yeah. So continue to fly the airplane, even though I'm taxiing, taxi to and do a complete takeoff sequence again. That's how you learn how to take off and land. But maybe you already know how to take off and land, and we just want to practice a certain landing. And then you go and you practice that certain landing and we can take off again. Well, during those touch and go maneuvers, ATC might tell you, you're not authorized touch and go. This next landing is full stop only because of weight turbulence. So they are, they are taking that part of, uh, of your decision making away from you. And not to say that you, you couldn't have made a better decision, but they're saying this one will be full stop because we have weight turbulence and I'm not gonna accept the risk as the controller. Doesn't happen often, but you'll hear that happen sometimes. Winds. These are different winds and different uh, friction layers, okay? Remember earlier at the beginning, every now and then it, 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 it's hard for me to remember what the heck that thing is supposed to be. But remember what I told you in the beginning when we said the high clouds? And I was telling you stratus clouds is typically a nice smooth ride, but I found those on the low side. Those are low clouds. And we might have stratus clouds in the mid layer. Uh, cumulus clouds were typically on the extensive vertical development. And those type of clouds usually had the very bad ride and a lot of turbulence. We were talking high clouds and I said the cirrus, I didn't know. I had no idea if that was a nice ride or not because there could be clear air turbulence. And that's exactly what we have shown here. You can see the clear air turbulence and it couldn't happen at any, la any layer at all. Usually I'm gonna find it somewhere in the upper atmosphere, very strong winds. That clear air turbulence, if I see clouds like this with waves or you can see them generating waves like so, anytime you see clouds that are, even if they're thin clouds and they have waves and continuous waves, this is a great indication that I have clear air turbulence, okay? So underneath this cloud could be some pretty bad turbulence in, in the clear, not inside of any cloud at all. All of a sudden you're being bumped around. You gotta make sure you have your seatbelt on. Okay, on the downside of a mountain wave, here I got my downslope winds. This is the lee wave region, so the leeward side of that mountain the back side of the mountain from where the wind is blowing, it can produce rotor waves. And rotor waves oftentimes will have a cloud development. Again, these have very, very strong, powerful winds underneath of them. I can see an example of a rotor roll cloud here, a cap cloud over a mountain here, and then everybody's favorite, which for years and years, and still in the FAA book, it shows Mount Fiji, but this is your lenticular cloud, the standing lenticular cloud. They'll say it's almond shaped or lens shaped like a contact lens. Inside the cloud, well, it looks like a nice thin cloud, terribly turbulent. Also underneath the cloud is very, very, very turbulent. Now I don't like what Jepson did on this one because they took away the mountain. Now, like, if you go to that advisory circular, you look at standing lenticular cloud, it's gonna show you Mount Fiji. There's no mountain listed here. Part of the criteria for standing lenticular clouds 
is when winds blow at least 40 knots or greater over a mountain or a mountain ridge. So eh, there really should be a mountain here, not a building or a bar or whatever that is. I don't know, a nightclub. Okay. Another invisible hazard. Clear air turbulence was an invisible hazard. Any of this stuff below the lenticular cloud and in the mountain range region, those are invisible hazards. I can't see them. They exist. It produces turbulence. But another invisible hazard is a microburst. All right. How many people do not know what I'm saying when I say microburst? I'd expect probably everybody's hand to go up, right? It's okay. I see a couple, so I'm happy about that. All right. The microburst means that some part of the atmosphere began pushing air straight towards the ground. There is not any visible moisture in this. So it's not associated with rain. It's not associated with, a, uh, with fog, a cloud, nothing. It may come out of a cloud, but there is a strong blast of wind moving directly towards the earth. If I take a garden hose and I turn the water on and I point the water straight at the ground, straight at the concrete, okay? That water is going to come straight out of this garden hose. And once it hits the concrete, it will move in all different directions. Correct? This is the exact same thing that happens in a microburst encounter. Okay. The only difference is you cannot see it because it's just wind. Now who remembers? I don't remember the airline. How was it Delta? I don't know. I read and study a lot of these things. I can't remember all the details. Remember it was in Texas in the seventies or eighties where a 747 had a microburst encounter. What happened to everybody on that flight? Right. That's correct. They didn't have sufficient power to get out of it. That's correct. And they crashed. And how many people lived? I don't think any of them lived. Okay. If you think for a second, Boeing 747, think this is several hundred people. This is a big airplane and they didn't survive this. Okay. I can tell you that a friend of mine in Fort Lauderdale, I used to work, who, who knows what Banyan is? I say Banyan a lot. I usually say that when I'm at the airport because everybody knows what Banyan is. Anybody know what Banyan is? It's just Banyan. It's a flight. Uh, it's a uh, FBO and they have a pilot shop and they have a terminal and people get together there. They talk or whatever. Well, I used to work at Banyan. They also deliver the fuel. So when you guys get done uh, with the airplane at the end, you call Banyan, you get your fuel. Well, I used to work at Banyan and another one of the guys that worked there, he had suffered an accident and it actually broke his back. He was not the pilot in command. They were in a Grumman Tiger. And the pilot in command died. And the last thing he remembered was being on base and then in the hospital. And they were, they encountered a microburst. Okay. Can't see it. You have no idea it's there. It's not likely at all. When I say you would probably be struck by lightning before you have a microburst encounter, that's probably true. But the danger is that if you get into one and if you start encountering one of these things, you have to recognize it right away. If you ever even think that you could stand a chance to survive. Okay. So just like we're talking here and it doesn't have to be on takeoff. It could be while they're in cruise flight or while they're approaching the land, like the 747 was here. I've got a tremendous amount of headwind <clears throat> and that headwind 
was characterized as wind shear. In other words, it was wind that changed speed or direction rapidly in a small period of time. So when I say that all of a sudden I have a head wind, that doesn't mean that I was flying from Tampa to New Orleans and the headwind changed two or three knots. No, this means within the matter of two, three, four seconds, a, a headwind that I might have had of five knots became 80. Okay, so a large change happened almost instantly. Now, what kind of indications do I get inside my airplane? Airspeed is gonna go fast very quickly. What kind of indications am I gonna get on the flight controls and with my pitch? Remember, this thing is set up so that if I get any increase in speed, what happens here? More lift. What happens here? More lift, but remember this lift is this way. So I get a rapid increase in airspeed. A so, and at the exact same time, I get a simultaneous pitch up and an increase in altitude. This sounds like stuff I like, right? This really does. It sounds like, hey, I got a lot of performance all of a sudden. So just what they did in the 747, they decreased power. The only problem is here, this turns into a 6,000 foot per minute downdraft. Now, we haven't flown a whole lot of airplanes just yet, but do you think this is gonna climb 6,000 feet a minute? On a fantastic day with really cold conditions and a perfect, 70, well, perfect 172, you might climb at 900 feet per minute if you're the only person in it in half tanks, okay? So there's not a chance in the world you're gonna climb at 6,000 feet a minute. Instead, it's going to cause you to, to go down. Okay, and one added little cherry on the top, if you would, is that once you get to the other side, here I had an 80 knot increase in airspeed. Now here, I get not only that 80 knot go away, but then 80 more knots come off. So total, I lost 160 knots. Well, What's the never exceed speed in 172? There's a AFM around here somewhere, it's 163. So if I were at my maximum speed, I have three knots remaining. You can see the hazards associated with thing, this thing. Microburst encounter uh, escape strategy is just that. And for each airplane, each airplane will have their own escape strategy. Most, most airplanes that I've been involved with, you apply it no matter what, as soon as you get that rapid increase in airspeed, you apply max mechanical power, okay? 20 degrees pitch up, so what have I done? I've just taken the fan and I've pointed it up. That's all I've done, I've taken the, the, the propeller, the fan, and I point it up. And then you make no other configuration changes. If you have flaps down, if you have flaps 10, flaps 20, flaps whatever, leave the flaps where they are, okay? And then just wait and that's all you can do, okay? Again, not likely, but that is your microburst right there. Okay, the strongest downdraft, by the way, is here, here, and here, I get down to this. Is, the winds are actually pushing that airplane straight towards the earth. So if you encounter a piece of uh, land uh, here, uh, you should go around. Yeah. I, I like your optimism. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking if you wake up, then yeah. Maybe, maybe you've already gone around and you're already at the uh, Memorial Hospital. So, yeah. What's the, what's the timing of this event? Is it one second? It could be a mile and a half long. So I got a mile and a half from here all the way over there. And these generally last from 15 to 20 minutes. No, I mean, for a pilot. 
for the pilot. Well, it's a mile and a half across. So if I'm doing two miles a minute, I got about a full minute inside of fun here. You know, so what, what's, what's fun is that the FAA, in conjunction with the NTSB and the FAA safety team, and I got to really hand it to the FAA, as much as so, some of the inspectors I don't get along with, but they, they, do, they, they do take their jobs very seriously, and, and they put a lot of thought, and, they, and they, they approach these things usually very objectively, where something like this happens... Is it the pilot's fault? Almost always. But their methodology, because it truly is, and their methodology as they work through it, though, they, out, you know, it, it, they take a stance of, let's put ourselves in that pilot's situation. We're all sitting here in a nice cozy room talking about what we would do. These pilots were ex expecting to land in just another two or three minutes. And then all of a sudden, Mother Nature hands them tragedy. You know, so we don't know. I truly don't know how I'd react. And that's how the FAA takes a stance when they're studying these things, too. But what they've done on a lot of these cases and a lot of the ones where survivability was almost nil, they will develop very, very lifelike because we have all the air data from the air data recorders and the radar and everything else. They will develop very, very similar conditions, almost exact conditions in a simulator full motion state-of-the-art simulator and they'll process flight crews through and then we'll run studies like that year after year after year to see if anybody can survive that so far there's been only a small percentage i think if any ever pilot that survived in the box on the simulator so it was just an, an unavoidable inescapable situation and now we're talking about pilots that got into the simulator fully knowing what they were going to get into they knew that they were going to encounter a microburst, so they didn't reduce power when they got here. They knew that they, were, they had a game plan on what they were going to do. Crew coordination was already there. They're in an air conditioning simulator, you know, and they're still not surviving on that. So it's just a matter of, hey, that one is a tough one. I don't know. Yeah, it's all doom and gloom, but you're not going to find one of these things, okay? <laughs> it's not that bad. All right, now then, man, the colors on this are terrible. Anybody recognize that? Mountain. Mountain? Where at? What's that? I, I certainly would. Th this is Russia. <laughs> That's exactly what this is. Yeah. So one of the one of the hazards is volcanic ash. It's in the guided flight discovery. It's in the, the Jepson book. Uh, but anyways, yeah, that's volcanic ash. So volcanic ash, although we don't we don't experience it too too much very often, especially not in the 48 states that are attached to the United States, not Hawaii and Alaska or any of that, right? But we don't experience it very often. However, sometimes large volcanoes erupt in Europe and we'll have no TAMs that affect us and they'll definitely affect our international flight crews. So just to round it off, are we gonna spend a lot of time on it? No, I love the picture. It looks a lot better on my screen. I wish, I wish we had, look at that, right? Anyways, they, uh, uh, they do make us mention a little bit about volcanic ash. Okay.